Well, one of the, the title that you see it says priests and preachers enter Islam, and that's a stimulus actually to have folks wake up and say, "Now, what is this all about?" And in the story that I'm about to tell you, I'm going to explain to you from the very beginning. This is a true story. Of course, I'm telling it from my perspective, having been not just the observer but a participant <laughs> in this story. So it was going to be a, it's a, not objectivity, it's subjectivity. And as much as I can, I'll try to tell you from somebody that's observing it, but obviously uh, I'm the one in it. It's been 17 years and I've had an opportunity to kind of perfect the story out to the point that I can put some humorous things along the way. But when it happened, it was a very real thing to me and to those who were who are in the story. But I will assure you, the story is true, and this is how it comes about. It happened that many years ago, my father came to me and he said that we're going to start doing business with a man from Egypt. And I like that idea, this international flavor, and it looked good, going to maybe make some logos with pyramids or the Sphinx, Nile River, that kind of thing. I was thinking about Cleopatra and, you know, how can we make some kind of uh, focal points here for the things we're going to be selling and doing. And he said, by the way, he's a Muslim. And I said, what? A Muslim? Mm, why are you going to do business with those guys? In those days, we had a good relationship with a lot of the TV evangelists and the Born Again Christian Ministries, and uh, you know. It happened that we had just been talking with some of the folks that are in that kind of ministry, and they were saying that these Muslims, they don't even believe in God. They're terrorists, they're hijackers, kidnappers. And they worship a black box in the desert and they kiss the ground five times a day. And these were the nice things that they said. So my dad said, no, I want you to meet this guy. He's really nice. So I agreed. I said, no, you don't do it. But it has to be on my terms. He said, what's that? I said, I have to come to him from church. And I want to come to him straight from church fasting. Now, those of you who are Muslims, you know what fasting is, right? Well, for Christians, it doesn't have to be exactly like that. For me, it was just basically I'm going to fast from the time I leave the church until the time my meeting's over with him. <laughs> it means I'm not going to stop off at the local cafeteria after we have church. And I was uh, going to have my Bible with me, of course. I used to carry a big cross. And I had my cap on that said, Jesus is Lord, across the top of it. And that is how I went to meet this Muslim. Along the way, though, I was imagining that this man is going to be wearing a long robe, and he's going to have, you know, a cape around it, and a big turban, and he's going to have his sword, and an eyebrow that goes all the way across, and... I'm imagining something like where they had the, was Ayatollah Khomeini, you know. So when I went in the, our store, and I said, where is he? He says, right here. I said, this guy? He's wearing just regular American clothes. Maybe he's in disguise, you know. And he didn't have a beard. I was imagining, you know, this huge, no beard at all. In fact, he didn't have any hair. He's bald-headed. I said, this is the guy, yeah. And I met him and said, hello, how are you? First thing I got right to business, I said, you don't believe in God, do you? He said, yeah. Said, yeah, but you don't, you don't believe in the real God. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, the God of Adam and Abraham. He said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, but you, you do? He said, yeah. You don't, you don't believe like in Moses and the Ten Commandments and stuff like that. You don't believe in the Bible. He said, yeah, we believe in the Bible. Yeah, right. 
said, but you don't, you don't believe in the New Testament. He said, yeah. He said, but you don't believe in Jesus. He said, yes. You do? He said, yeah. yeah. But you don't believe that he's the Messiah. He said, yes. The Christ. He said, yeah. The miracle birth? Yes. Yeah, but you don't believe he's with God, he's coming back. He said, yeah. Well, now here's a word for you. Some of you probably heard it. Logos. You don't believe he's the Logos. He said, yeah, the word. Whoa, okay. It's going to be pretty easy to convert this guy, you know. <laughs> So I told Dad, yeah, let's do business guy. So we did. We started traveling together. And we'd go long distances in the car. And while we were traveling, I would tell him, well, you know, to stay awake and everything. Let's just have discussions. You know, talk about things like religion. And that's what we did. We would talk about different aspects of beliefs. But I found that anything that we talked about, this man always seemed to have a lot more insight, information, and references than I did. Which became frustrating after a while. Because I felt like, how am I going to actually win any of these debates? Since I can't keep running across subjects that not only does he have more information on, but the way he presents and his logic and his steps and his answers back to me, <laughs> I just feel like I wish I hadn't brought it up. And then I went to talk to one of my friends, another preacher, and he said, you know, you need to stay away from these Muslims. You really do. There's no benefit here, and uh, they're basically devils. And uh, I, I don't recommend this. Now, this particular individual used to have a big wooden cross. He carried it. It was in two pieces. They were beams. Two beams and you could bolt them together. It had a little wheel at the bottom of one piece and he bolt this thing together, put it over his shoulder and he used to walk down the street and go out to the highways and walk along with this big cross. I don't know if you've ever heard about him or not. Sometimes he makes it to the news. He just walks with it and then people will stop. What's this all about? What do you got going on? And then when they stop, he can give them his literature, you know. Well, it happened that one day he had a heart attack and he went to the hospital and I'd go visit him over there. Well, when I would visit him, he had a roommate, somebody sharing the hospital room with him. And this person was in a wheelchair. And I went over to talk to him and I like to witness. This is what they call it in Christianity. You call it witnessing. You Muslims, you talk about dawah. Well, this is witnessing. So I went to witness to him with my Bible. And I asked him, where are you from? He said, I'm from Mars. And I said, uh, you know, because in Texas we have a city called Venus. There is Venus, Texas. I'm thinking, Mars. What is that close to? <laughs> then I realized that he was telling me basically to get lost. Now, a couple of times I kept going back over there and I would talk to this guy and I pushed him around in the wheelchair and was trying to witness to him from the book of Jonah. Talking about the difficulties that Jonah experienced, especially being inside of a whale is a pretty rough deal. And by the way, for reference purposes, uh, for the Muslims, there is a book in the Old Testament called the Book of Jonah. And you know him as Yunus. He's mentioned in the Quran. It's a similar story, almost the same. The only difference is the Muslims, you have a saying of Jonah, which we don't have in the Bible. It may have been there and got lost somewhere, but there's still a lovely saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka. What's the rest of it? Any kuntumina dalami. You know the meaning of it, that there's none worthy to worship except you, Almighty God. And all the glory is to you. And verily, 
I'm in the situation that I'm in because I have wronged myself. And this is a beautiful teaching. You know, 1400 years ago, you can't imagine that somebody could come up with something like this. It's an excellent psychology because if you think about it, all of us would be better off if we would admit that the circumstances that I'm in, I brought about myself. One of the first things they tell an alcoholic, you know, if you want to get well, you have to admit you're an alcoholic. And that's very good advice, good, I think, a recognition of an individual. Now, anyhow, while I was talking to this man in the wheelchair, he didn't speak to me. He would just grunt. Finally, I saw him crying while I was reading the things to him from the book of Jonah. And he looked up at me and he said, I'm sorry. I said, why? He said, I'm sorry for the way I've been treating you and the way I've been acting. And I said, oh, what was okay? He said, no, it's not okay. I shouldn't be like this. And he said, I, I, I need to confess something to you. I said, hold on a second. I'm just a preacher. I'm not a priest. I'm not Catholic, okay? I don't do confessions. He said, I know you're not a priest. I am. And it turns out he was a Catholic priest. He, like my friend, had also had a heart attack. So when he was well enough to leave the hospital and he needed to convalesce, I actually invited him to come and live in the house with us. And that's how a Catholic priest came to be in our house. Who, actually, if you think about it, here we're... Uh, uh, Protestants, my father was a minister, and I'm preaching, we're, by the way, two different churches, and now we've got a Catholic priest in here. And I'm thinking, okay, three against one, us against the Muslim. We're going to get this guy one way or the other. And it happened that we would sit around at night, around the table, and when we were through eating, clear everything away and have our discussions. And one night we brought out the Bible. I said, let's go with that. Bring out the Bible. So that brings out his. I bring out mine. We're going to start reading. But he's got the King James Version of the Bible. This is, you know, goes back to 1611. And I've got my Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And in the beginning of it, it says that the King James Version has grave defects. It's really clear on this point. It even tells you where the mistakes are in it, the contradictions, the deletions, etc., etc. It goes into detail about that. And then along the way in the verses that you see, it gets footnotes in there telling you this is this way, this is that way. There never was anything like this. This was changed. That was so and so. So I'm talking to my dad now, you see, no, your book says this, and he's saying, but this is, and I'm saying, no, but this is so-and-so. Now, in the meantime, my wife brings out her book, she has, I think, what's it called, Good News for Modern Man, Jimmy Swaggart's Bible, <laughs> and that's a lot different. And then the Catholic Priest's Bible, anybody's Catholic? This book, the Reims de Roy Bible, has 73 books. Protestant Bible has 66 books. You're talking about a lot of difference here. And even the books that are the same name have different verses in them and different orders of verses. So somehow we got off on the wrong foot on that. We were talking about that instead of witnessing, you see. And then we wind up in this big, I don't want to call it an argument, but it was a pretty heavy discussion about Bibles. My Bible versus your Bible. And then I realized, here's the Muslim sitting over there. I'm thinking, okay, 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 hold on. It's not going the right way. I said, uh, excuse me, tell us, uh, how many versions do you have of that uh, book of yours, of that Koran thing? He said, the Quran has no versions. So what do you mean? He says, the Quran is still exists, and there's only one. I said, what? He said, there's only one, and it's in Arabic. Otherwise, it's not the Quran. If you try to translate, it's not the Quran. But in Arabic, it's recited, and it's recited the same everywhere in the world. There's no two versions of it. All Muslims recite exactly the same Quran. 
one and a half billion. I'm like, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> Let's change the subject. A few nights later, we we're going to try again. I had another approach. This time, we're going to talk about God. So I prepared the table, right? Let's talk about God. Okay. Our concept of God is that God is, all, is love. God is love. And God is one. And he said to me, I hear you guys talking about Trinity. I said, yes. He said, can you explain the Trinity? Now at this time, the, the Catholic priest, you know, the Catholics are big on the Trinity thing, right? But he's the real silent and sitting there and just doesn't say anything. So I'll explain it. He said, how do you explain it? How do you explain three equals one? He said, no, 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 no. It's not like that. In fact, there are many examples. For instance, if you say, right here, how many people, hold up your hand if you think there's only one God. Hold your hand up. If there's only one God. No, no, hold up to show it. See? Show it. One God, right? One? Huh? Now, but watch. When you go like that, you have three bones right here. So three can be one, right? Can one be three? See? Because you have, that's one of the examples. <laughs> you just compared God to your finger. <laughs> so, <laughs> the next thing, well, we, was, <laughs> we tried everything. I said, um, it's like an apple. An apple has a skin on the outside, meat on the inside, and seeds on the inside of that. He said, well, how many seeds are in there? Why? He said, well, don't you have to add that in too? No, 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 no. So the next day, I said, let me, let me go get some reinforcement. I went back to my friend with the cross. And I asked him, okay, how can we explain Trinity? He said, you don't. You just accept it. As a matter of fact, I said, yeah, but I'm trying to tell this Muslim. He said, you still tell that guy, get away from this guy, man. He's going to mess you up. You're going to get a demon, son. See what he said. He even told his wife, get the Bible. This boy's got a demon. Anyway. <laughs> he gave me the egg. You know the egg? So I'm going back with the egg story. Ready? The egg <clears throat> has a shell. Inside of the shell is the white. Inside of the white is the yellow. And that's three things, one egg. Just compared God to an egg. He said, well, what if it's a double yolk? <laughs> That's not a good idea. He said, what if it's rotten? Mm. And about that apple, what if it has a worm in it? I get, what is this? Now, I talked to another guy the next day about this thing. So he's young. I guess he is sort of like a wannabe preacher. And I was talking to him and he said, no, 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 no. You told him the wrong thing. You should never talk about, don't talk about the egg. Don't talk about that. No, 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 no. We don't use that anymore. He said, no. You get to realize we're all children of God. Okay. And that is the way you explain the Trinity. Okay. He said, okay, you see me? He said, yeah. He said, I'm one. Yeah. I'm a man, yes. You see my wife, yeah, she's one. She's a woman, yes. See my son, yes. Well, he's one. Now that's one, 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 and we're one family. That's how it works. It's the family of God. Okay. I'm not going back with this story. As soon as I get back, he's going to ask me, what if you have another kid? I know that's going to happen. Then he's probably going to throw out some, what if you get a divorce? <laughs> State of Texas, you get a divorce from a woman, she gets the house, she gets the car, she gets your keto plan, your retirement, she gets your house, the, the whole bit, the computer, your email, all of it. No, I don't want to go for that. What can I use to really explain this to this guy? And now, uh, listen to this one. Here we go. Water. We all know about water. And the 
these codes that is here, you already know about ice too. Coming in tonight, don't you? Water can be ice, can't it? Water is a liquid. Water can be ice, and water can be steam. Right? But those still, those three are still one thing. Is that right? Still what? The problem here is. It could never all be the same thing at the same time. Could it? No. How am I going to explain this? And now I'm wishing I would have left off, just like the priest did, and just said, matter of faith, leave it. So I, <laughs> again, I turned to the Muslim and I said, well, what do you guys believe? What do you believe? He said, Kulhu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yilid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yukulahu Kufuan Ahad. Meaning, say, He is Allah, the one, unique, the one who is Samad, who is eternally sought after by the creation. Well, He does not need the creation independent from it. He's not fathered, he's not born, he is not begotten, he doesn't beget is the meaning of it. And there's nothing like unto him because he is Ahad, unique. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. The Catholic priest asked him at one point if he could go to the mosque with him. He'd like to see a mosque. He'd never visited one. And I'm telling him, yeah, you don't want to go over there, man. I heard we're going to get demons with, from this guy. You know, Just be careful. And he started laughing at me. He said, listen, you know, in order to be a priest, one of the things we have to do is study other religions. And I've already studied Islam. And I already know about Islam. I just want to go see what it's like in the, in the mosque over there. I said, you know about it? I said, yeah. Okay. When he came back, we took him aside. We said, uh, what do they do? Do they like slaughter an animal or something, you know? He said, no. He said, these people came, these men lined up, made a line. And he said, they stood there like monks. And then they bowed and they prostrated. They worshiped silently and they left so that's it so that's it what kind of music did they have <laughs> i was a music minister he said they didn't have any music i said what how are you going to worship god without music they didn't hmm. now there were some other things going on at the same time and we picked up some pamphlets and how to answer Muslims, things like this, to look through this. And the Muslim himself had brought some things to read. I'm looking at this and that and comparing. I'm thinking, how come we didn't know any of this? How come we... This isn't the information we're getting from the media. This isn't what we're learning from the, you know, uh, encyclopedias even. We're not, where's the, where's the information about this stuff? Since then, I'm going to digress this for a minute and tell you something. Since then, I found something really amazing. When I was out in the southwest part of the United States in a restaurant waiting for food to come, and they had a display of old books. You know, sometimes they get sort of a theme in a restaurant, and they got these old things laying around. There was a set of encyclopedias, really, really old in a cabinet. And I asked them if I could look at it while we were waiting for the food. They said, go ahead. Of course, I went to letter I, you know, I.J., pulled it out, thumbed it open to Islam. Now, this was a 1929 edition, I think of Grow Your, one of the well-known encyclopedias. I looked up Islam, and I fully expected to see what I had in mind at home, which was see Mohammedism. Islam, see Mohammedism. And you see Mohammedism, a religion started by Mohammed in the desert. That's it. But now I'm looking at this old 1929 
Then you open up Islam. From the Arabic root Salama, meaning to surrender, submit, obey. And I'm reading this as a Muslim at that time, and I'm going, hell is right. In peace to Almighty God, the one Lord, Allah, this is the same word used by Christians who are Arabs and Jews who are Arabs. I'm going, wow. Imagine this. In 1929, we knew this stuff. And it went on for six pages explaining Islam, Muslims, the Salat, Zakat, Hajj, Ramadan, the pillars of belief in Iman, in Allah, his books, his angels, his prophets, the day of judgment, the Qadr of Allah, and then a paragraph explaining Qadr of Allah that a lot of Muslims need to be reading about today. All of us in this old encyclopedia, in English, published in New York, and you're like, what happened from 1929 to 1989? that we forgot all this information? It's a good question. Very good question. In any case, I'm going to come now back to the story. The Catholic priest decided to go back to that mosque again on another day. It was on a Monday. And he went, and they didn't come back. And it became dark, and we were worried about them. Where are they? What's going on? Finally, they came up the driveway. We lived out in the country, you know. And... Uh, I said, okay, they're back, it's okay. And then I saw my friend Mohammed get out of the car. And then this guy gets out of the car on the other side, and he's wearing all white like a dress. And he's got this little white cap on his head, you know. I said, what is this? And when he got up to the door, I recognized him. I said, this is the priest. I said, Pete, did you become a Muslim? He said, Ashadu la ilaha illallah, Ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. And I said, what is this? Now, I used to have a TV show. It was actually more of a music ministry kind of a show. It was called Estes Music Jamboree. So I got the cameras out, got the microphone out, the lighting, and set everything up. It takes time. By the time I got it all set up, I want to ask him on camera, what happened? He fell sound asleep on the couch. I said, oh, well, heck with it. Get to it tomorrow. I go upstairs, and I'm telling my wife, look, I'm trying to think, how can I break this to her? Because there were many of the things I'd learned, studied about Islam, and realized that this really made a lot of sense. But how can I introduce the subject to her in a way that we can together progress toward at least being serious about studying this? as a, an alternative to what we had. And when I'm talking, she says, you know what, I want to get a divorce. So how do we get into this subject? She said, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. did I say I want to be a Muslim? I did not say, did I say that? I did not say that. That was not me who said that. I didn't say that. In fact, I would never be a Muslim. Okay, put your mind at ease. Besides that, what he told us was that a Christian man isn't married to a Muslim woman. But if I wanted to be a Muslim, you could remain as a Christian with no problem. Okay? That's what he said. But I didn't say, well, don't get me wrong. But that is what he said, just for clarification. That a Muslim woman can't be married to a Christian man. She said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I want to be a Muslim. Okay, I didn't see that coming. I sat down on the bed and I was thinking, boy, you didn't read that. I said, okay, the good news is, the good news is, I too wish to be a Muslim. Okay? I, I want to be a Muslim too, and the problem is solved. She looked at me and she said, I don't believe you. So now I'm telling you the truth. I just didn't want to tell you. Okay? She said, I don't believe you. I said, I'm telling you the truth. She said, you're lying. I said, I'm not lying. She said, and you're a liar. I said, what? She said, you're lying now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you would never be Muslim? You're a liar. Now get out. 
She was right. That was a lie, wasn't it? So, I'm going down the stairs, you know, and I'm thinking, Hey, this is my father's house. How did I get kicked out of this deal? So I go wake up to Muslim and I said, Listen, you know, you and me, we got to talk. We got a problem. So what's the matter? I said, I'm going to talk to you. Let's go outside. Now we live in the country. So we start walking down these country roads in the dark. One side, down the other, back, forth. Up. And all night long, we're walking and talking. I'm doing all the talking. He's doing the walking. And we're just going along. And about the time the sun started to rise up, I said, well, you got to go pray your Fajr prayer. And he said, yeah. And he said, and you... You have to realize this subject you keep talking about, rattling on about, is not between you and me anyway. And it's not between you and your wife, it's not between you and your father. This is something between you and your Lord. You need to go talk to him. I said, what? I really thought he was, I was kind of like setting it up so that he could like say to me, well, why don't you go ahead and become a Muslim? He didn't. He said, why don't you go talk to your Lord? Talk to him. This is between you and him. Because you see, the word Islam is exactly that. It's describing the relationship between two entities. The word Islam, the etymology of the word is this. It comes from the root Sin Lam Mim. And from that, this word is pulled out. It's a verb, it's action. It means the surrender, obedience. The submission, sincerity, to a greater authority, the way the word is constructed, and in peace. All of that's in this word. So you see immediately from this, when there's submission, you, you have to have a minimum of two entities. One submitting to the other. So you're describing a relationship of a dominant over a subject and the one who is subjugated to the one above. This is what you're describing. And it means to do the will of the one in authority. This is from the word itself. We're not talking about religion, we're talking about the word. Islam teaches us that the, the religion of Islam is teaching that there's only one God. So if you say Islam and imply that, the next thing you're saying is then the, all the authority, all the worship, dedication, and so on, is only for him. No other gods beside God. This is a very beautiful way to describe the first commandment in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, when it talks about, Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. It also describes the same commandment which you find in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5. It also describes the commandment that Jesus speaks about in Mark 12, 29, when they said, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, it is to know, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. To understand that and to put it into practice is no different than what Islam is calling for. But it means that you don't relax commandments according to your desires. It means that you accept even if you don't know why. To give you a little understanding on that, in the Old Testament, it talks very clearly about forbidding the consumption of lachan kanzir, the flesh of the pig. The same thing that it says in the Quran. There's no difference. Both are forbidding eating this. But in modern times, I remember in the 1950s, they were publishing some books about this subject and talking about that, look, back then, this is how it starts out, back then, back when, it doesn't even say, this is back then, they didn't have refrigerators. So this meat would go bad real easy. And they talked about some of the diseases that come from eating this meat. But nowadays, you know, we have refrigeration and this animal can be slaughtered, it can be consumed, that's not a problem. That was the 1950s. 
In the 1960s, I remember, they had some real serious issues about it, saying that, well, even though we refrigerated this animal, <laughs> we still found things that when you heated the meat back up, still causes diseases, still causes this and that, and so they're going to start treating the meat with a chemical. And then 1970s, okay, that doesn't work, we've got a new problem with this meat, and it's still today. You've got people talking about the problems of eating and consuming pork, the so-called other white meat. As a Muslim, you don't worry about the why. You just say it's a commandment, so you don't do it. That's the point. It's a clear point. And if somebody said, well, why? I don't understand why. So is, does this mean before you obey a commandment, you have to know why? Do you? Because if this is your attitude, then what does it mean when you look at the commandments and it says, thou shalt not bear false witness? Why? I'll lie if I want to. Show me why. It could be good, you know. I could tell somebody this and that and make a lot of money and use the money for a good purpose. Well, yeah, if you think about it like that, you just go ahead and rob a bank and build a nice orphanage. Huh? And by the way, it also says, don't steal. That's what it says, don't steal. Why? Maybe I could steal, like, from the rich and give to the poor. Robin Hood did it. <laughs> by the way, in a Muslim country, he'd only have one arm. <laughs> all about that? Was it the Ten Suggestions or the Ten Commandments? Because if you're going to sit there and analyze each thing and say that, you know what, I don't see how that's relative to me, I don't have to do it. I'm right up and, <laughs> listen, I'm talking about Muslims coming to me and say, I don't see why we have to do this or that. Why? Well, it doesn't make sense today. We live in a modern world. We're not riding camels. That's one of the favorite things I like to say. Am I right? You heard about that, right? Some of the girls tell you that? Why do we have to wear a hijab today? That's back then, you know, when they had the wind blowing and everything and you had to come, but no, we don't have that today. Wait a minute, Chicago's a windy city, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. I'll ask you a question. What was the first sin of the human beings? Oh, somebody tell me. The first sin, what was it? Remember? I'm asking Jewish, Christian, Muslim. We got the exact same story. In case you didn't know it, the first man is Adam in all three religions. Created by God from dirt. Eve being created from bones. No different story. Even the pronunciation of Adam is Adam. The difference is that the way you say the name of Eve, it's Hawa. But big deal, it's the same story. God puts them in the Garden of Eden, in Arabic called Aden, but who cares? And they're in the paradise, and they can have anything they want. Anything, eat from anything, except what? One tree. One tree, don't eat the fruit of that tree. Is that right? Now why? Well, I don't see why. What's wrong with that fruit? I mean, it looks nice, tastes nice, smells nice, nobody got sick. Why can't we eat it? It's the exact same thing. The point is, you're told not to do it. But you did it. I'm sure I, didn't, I don't see the effect of it. The effect is, you didn't obey. How can you say, how can you say that you are a true believer when it's demonstrated to you right here by your own actions, you didn't comply? What is a Muslim? What is a Muslim? A Muslim in Arabic, if you knew Arabic and understood it, you, you wouldn't have this problem. You wouldn't say the silly things you do about Muslims. 
Because if you agreed with the first word that I said, Islam, makes sense. Islam, do what God wants you to do, okay? In English, we use ER after a verb to indicate the one who's performing the action. Walk, walker, talk, talker, think, thinker, stink, stinker. Oh, I might get carried away. No, you get the idea. In Arabic, you use the prefix of mu before the verb to indicate the one performing the action. Got me? Okay. I'll go through some motions. I'm not trying to give you a lesson in Arabic, but just show you how it works. Worshipping is called salah, so salli. Salli, salli. Musalli. Got it? Musalli. The one doing the action. Adhan. Adam, the one calling it Mu'adan, Mu'adan, traveling, Arabic, suffer, the one doing it, Mu'suffer, get it yet? Somebody is doing what God wants them to do, Islam, becomes a Muslim, ah, oh. see how easy that was? You believe in God? Yes. You want to do what God wants you to do? Yes. What are you? No. It happened to me. After I became Muslim, I went back down to Texas Valley. That's where I used to do a lot of preaching. We used to go across the border and try to convert the Catholics over to Protestant. So I'm down there and there was a real old lady, sweet as she could be. She was a sweetheart, but in her 80s. And she saw me, she looked at me, she said, Child, is that you? I said, yes, ma'am. Why are you wearing a dress? How come you grew in a beard? What happened to you? I said, I was like happy, you know what I'm telling her. I became a Muslim. Oh, you can't do that. I said, oh, why? You're not from over there. I said, from over where? She said, where did I come from? I said, whoa, oh, hold on, hold on. Miss Henderson, the idea here is that it's a word yet, I don't think you understand. To believe in one God, you believe in one God? Yes, of course. God is one. Yes. And you want to do what God wants you to do? She said, you know I do. I said, and you're willing to do his commandments on his terms, submit to him, and be in peace with whatever comes. She said, I've always been that way all my life. That's what you could be, one who does Islam, because it's the word Islam to do what God wants you to do. Oh, I didn't know that. So you're doing it. Yeah. So, mu, Islam, means one who does it. Oh, so you can be a Muslim. No, I can't. I said, why? I'm not from over there. Okay. Let it go. Now, these are some of the things that went through my mind that night when we were walking around talking. And I had to realize that it really is up to me and my Lord. It's not between me and anybody else. So I did go off as he advised me and I found a place that I felt like I was private between me and the Lord. And I put my head down on the ground, the same way I'd seen him do. Same thing mentioned in the Bible when it says they used to fall on their faces in worship and just poured out everything and put it in just a couple words. Oh God, guide me. That was it. And when I raised up my head, I looked around. I did not see dancing fairies and angels with musical instruments and you know rainbows and light shows and all the rest of it but what i did see is real clear inside of myself that the turmoil and the problems that i've been experiencing in my life could be really boiled down to the statement i said earlier in the program which i later came to know in islam la ilaha illa ante subhan kaini kuntumid Oh God, you are the only one worthy of any worship. And all the glory is to you. 
and in reality all these circumstances around me are because I have wronged myself. That's the reality. And if I want to make any change in my life, I want to have to start at the core of the matter. And interestingly enough, look what Allah says about that in the Quran. He said, he never changes the condition of a people until the people change themselves. So I don't know about you, but back then I was ready for change. And I did it. Alhamdulillah. Made a change. And been changing every day, hoping to get a little bit better each day. And trying to help other people find this same peace and resolution in proper change for the better. So I went back inside the house. And when I went in, I told him, I said, I'm ready. You know, I want to accept this lamb. I went upstairs, made the shower, everything. You know, the traditional deal you do. Came down and in front of the ex-priest who is now a Muslim. And the Muslim from Egypt, I did the shahara. A shadu on la ilaha illallah wa ashadun muhammadin abduhu or so. Which means essence, like... I bear witness there is only one to worship, which is Allah. No other gods except Him. He has no partners. And I bear witness Muhammad is His messenger and His servant. And with that, I entered into Islam. A few minutes later, my wife came down, had a little scarf on, I remember, you know, and she accepted Islam as well. It was a few weeks, maybe months, I guess, but my father finally came around and he entered his mom. And now when I look back over it, I think, look at this. My plan, when I started out with my cross and my cap and my Bible, was to go in here and get this Muslim and flip him over to Christianity. And look at who, I brought resources. My dad was one of the greatest salesmen you ever saw in your life and an excellent preacher. And the Catholic priest, he's pretty strong too. I'm trying to get resources, get these, you know. But what happened, everybody got involved, got the demon. <laughs> <laughs> And came to Islam. And since that time, we've all been trying to work of assimilating a beautiful message of what's Islam and sharing it with the people. So, so let me ask you, let's talk about God. God is... God is one. One. That's <laughs> yes. what I'm looking for. God is all right, one. All right, here's, here's what we do. I'll say this, and you say after me, if you believe it. If you don't, then don't say it. I swear. I swear. There is no God worthy to be worshipped. There is no God worthy to be worshipped. Except the one true God. Except one true God. Allah. Allah. Okay. And I swear. And I swear. Muhammad. Muhammad. Is his messenger. Is his messenger. Okay. Now we can do it in Arabic. Ashadu. Ashadu. An. An. La ilaha. La ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. La sharikala. La sharikala. Wa. Wa. Ashadu. Ashadu. Anna Muhammad. Anna Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. That's it. Guess what you just did? You entered this now. Congratulations. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God and Moses was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I'm just really happy and um, I'm glad to be in the truth. And I'm really happy. Me too. Me too. There, there's something we need to tell you. When you entered into Islam right here, Allah 
He forgave all of your sins since the day you were born. So you don't have any sins now. It's all gone. You got a new start. And you got good deeds. You get to keep all your good deeds. And no bad deeds. So that's a bonus. And if you ask him for anything now, it's direct. And you will receive immediate results from Allah. And another thing is that he's going to start testing you now. Big time. He promises you, but it will make it easy for you. He's going to test you, and then you'll see ease. You'll be tested, and this is a promise from Allah. Because coming to Islam is not to get the easy way, but it's to get the fair way and the balanced way. And you'll learn step by step. And you start learning how to do salah, follow the prayers, you know. And then we'll, after that, we'll be going into Ramadan in September. you are fasting the month of Ramadan. And then after that, you'll learn about zakah, giving uh, the charity. You don't have to worry about that for a whole year. And then after that, there'll be Hajj. And then if you can go to Mecca once in your lifetime, Allah make a way, then that completes your Islam. As easy as that. And uh, there is some study to do. It's good to start learning the Arabic language. It's good to sit with the study circles. And it's good to spend some time with the brothers. But one thing you want to be careful of, very careful, is the devil is not going to give up on you. He's going to give up on the fact that, he, you know, he knows you're not going to worship idols and statues and stuff, any of that. But he's still going to try to work on you to try to at least get you away from the Muslims. So one of the hardest tests that we in the West have in Islam is to keep from separating up into all these silly groups. Don't do that. Respect each other. If somebody's in a group, that's his choice. But don't get into this. Stay away from that. Just love all your brothers and appreciate the good from each, each one or each group and let it go with that. It makes sense? Yes. Right. Okay. Do, you have, do you have any question you want to ask? <clears throat> <laughs> well, we're real happy to have you as our brother in Islam and take everything slow step by step one by one and inshallah God willing you'll find that this is a, a wonderful way of life it's called the deen or way of life and this is by the way the deen show that you're watching mm -hmm. so watch us here on deen show for a lot more programs like this and we hope we see a lot more folks like Stephen understand this message in coming to Islam Till next time, this is Yusuf Estes here in Chicago saying, hey, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>